Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Bwana asifiwe sana. God is good. And all the time God is good. We want to invite you to our online service today. This is Membly Baptist Church and we are so happy and are glad that you could tune in and uh, fellowship together with us. The Bible says in the book of Matthew 11 and 28, says Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What a promise, what a call, what a powerful uh, proclamation that Jesus is telling us today. Come, all you who labor, the burdens that we bear, and he promises to give us rest. Why, why, why won't you come? Why will we not go and come even unto him? So this day we invite you for a time of fellowship, for a time of hearing God's word, for a time of just laying our burdens uh, and the things that we carry at the cross of, 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 of Calvary because Jesus cares and is well able to take and carry our burdens. Amen. Lord, we thank you and we honor you for today. Thank you for this service, oh God. Thank you for gathering us here. Thank you for life, health, and wellness. Jesus, we come to you today to honor you and to worship you. But we also come, Lord, in confidence, knowing that our sins are forgiven, knowing that our burdens are, have been taken away, and every weight that we, we bear will be taken away, and it has been taken away. So, Lord, we come at the cross of Calvary, Lord, to call upon you, O God, that, Lord, we may receive from you, Lord, the Lord, we may receive relief, freedom, peace from your presence. We thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Welcome for a time of worship as we exalt the name of the Lord. Okay. So we're just going to be singing, leaning on the everlasting arm.
Amen. Hallelujah. Leaning on those everlasting arms. I am a coffee quest. I for Papa Moja. Tunata to say me kumba yeni mungu.
Pe bwana makofi ya vigele gele As we exalt the Lord and declare these praises Oh Lord we come to you God And acknowledge that there is none like you In heaven in the earth oh God That is why we will worship you Lord Lord we are made in your image Lord That we may worship you and bring, bring you glory So Father we honor you and we worship you Hey. And all creation we bow at your feet Every nation declare you are king You are Lord over everything Jehovah, Jehovah All creation
Lord, to the ends, let it be known that there is no God like our God. Lord, you are highly exalted, and we bow to you, Lord, and we honor you, God. May you be glorified today. May you be lifted. For we worship you and we bow to you, Lord. For you do mighty and great things, O God. Creator of the universe. Lord, what are men and sons of men that you may think of them, Lord? But they are just a drop in the ocean. But Lord, you are mindful of us. O God, you look at us with your eyes of mercy. So Lord, we honor you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a mighty hand clap today. Amen. Lord, we thank you and we bless you for your good and there is no one like you. Amen. We want to hear God's word. We want to just get to another uh, chance where we get to, to sit under the feet of Jesus and hear God's word. And we pray that, that the Lord will speak to us, that we'll be receptive, that our hearts will be ready to hear. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you and we honor you. May you speak to us today. May your word come forth, O God, with power. May you rebuke us. May you correct us. May you edify us. Lord, may you uplift us. May you sharpen us. We honor you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Greetings in Jesus' name. It's, we, we thank God for today. It's a day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We continue with our series on the spirit of sonship. The spirit of sonship. And we began together by looking at the lost son and then son of the most high. And today we look at the third part of the series. And this is slaves to sons, from slaves to sons. And we'll be taking time together exploring what does the word of God have to tell us about shifting from slaves to sons. Um, so we're going to read Galatians chapter 4, 1, 8 to 11, and then Romans 8, 12 to 17. Um, Romans, Galatians 4, 1 to 11, Romans 8, 12 to 17. And I read, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a, his master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the influence of the, sorry, even, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. In Romans 8, 12 to 17. Therefore, brethren... We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Heavenly Father, we thank you 
May you speak to us. May you minister to us. Help us to understand how we move from slaves to sons and how the spirit of sonship comes to life within our spirits. We who are adopted as sons, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Today we'll take time together to look at slaves and understand slavery, to look at um, masters, and to look at sonship. And we'll begin, first of all, by just getting back into history, and we will be looking at the types of slaves, especially the Greco-Roman slaves, you know, from the Greek culture and the Romans who came over to rule for a long period of time. What did it mean to be a slave? Now, there were two sets of slaves. There was the domestic slaves and there were the non-domestic slaves. Domestic slaves worked in the homes. That's where they worked. They worked in the homes. And, you know, they did all the home chores that they'd be given by their masters. However, the non-domestic slaves, some of them would work in mines. Some of them would work in firms. Some would even become gladiators. And some of them would get even to fight in battles, you know. Uh, for with them alongside their masters or for their country that who in which they were in bondage. In fact, some even did many your jobs uh, as they were given. And uh, one of the things was in how to become a slave. You could become a slave simply because there was a war, and you lost in the war. And after losing in the war, then you are captured and you become slaves to your new masters. You could also become a slave. If you're born into slavery, if your parents were slaves, then you're born into slavery and you live as a slave for your master, who was also the master of your parents. But there was a third way of becoming a slave. And this is where you had a debt. And for you to pay up that debt, then you actually had to um, be either stake yourself in or be sent in as a slave and you, until you fully pay off that debt. And those were some of the ways one would actually become a slave. In fact, the Bible even talks about it and tells us about the, uh, the Jesus gave the parable in Matthew 18, 21 to 30. Matthew 18, 21 to 30. And this is the account of the, of the, of the unforgiving servant. And in this account, we find a man who was forgiven by his master a debt. But after he was forgiven the debt, he then went and met someone who owed him much less. But he couldn't forgive him and actually put him into prison until he pays up. When the master knew about it, he actually sent him to prison to to make sure that he pays up. And you realize the whole family was also affected, so to speak. And so one would actually become a slave because they have a debt. And for them to pay it up, they have to be in bondage. They have to become then uh, as prisoners, so to speak. And as they become thus, then they would actually pay up that debt, so to speak. So what are the conditions of slavery? Slaves used to live in slave quarters. They were not living with the rest of the people. In fact, domestic slaves were really seen as high standing because they would enjoy the sense of comfort of being in the home. Of course, doing the works they were supposed to do. The worst of all, while a domestic slave was seen at, as a, at a very high level, so to speak, the slaves working in, my, in mines were the lowest and those were suffering the most because when you work in the mines, the mines would collapse and a lot of slaves would die. In fact, even little children would die as well working in the mines. The conditions in mines were terrible. The technology we have, they didn't have. And so archaeologists have excavated, you know, remains of people who died a long time ago who were actually slaves working in those places. So one, they lived in, in slave quarters. They lived near the storehouses or near the burns. Among the Romans, you know, a slave had a, one piece of, a piece of clothing, and they would only get a changing of that every two years and shoes. And, um, you know, at one time, uh, the average household had five slaves. Until one time, one of the senators called Seneca proposed, why don't we have slaves wearing uniform? But the Senate said, no, if they know how many they are, they are going to rebel against us. A slave was a property of his master. A slave was a property of his master. Now, if a slave had a wrongdoing, he would be flogged, he would be punished, you know, he would be scourged. But if the slave rebelled, my God, he would be hanged, you know, on the cross, he would be crucified, his limbs would be cut off. He was a property of the master. In fact, it is told that some slaves were so loyal, if the master committed a crime or a felony, whatever he did, and was taken to court to answer charges, slaves would refuse 
um, to give evidence against their masters. So they had to be tortured to give evidence against their masters. That's how loyal they were. And why are we looking at this closely, friends? So that when Paul says, Paul, a bond servant, or Paul is more of, of a slave of Jesus Christ, we then understand the context with which he's speaking. When Paul says that, he's not speaking about a, an employee who's on contract, eight to five. Only a third of the day does he work for the supervisor or the boss or the owner of the company, but two-thirds of the time they, have, they can do whatever they want. No, 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 no. When Paul talks about being a bond servant or talking about being a slave of Christ, he literally means he has to, he's so, he has to be so loyal, the Lord can do with him whatever he pleases. How would a slave become free? He could become free once granted freedom by a master. There were incidences where slaves would earn. And you can imagine how long it would take to earn. Then they would actually buy their freedom. <clears throat> another one is when another master would buy off a slave. And maybe if they had total goodwill, sell them free. But guess what? Another way of a slave becoming free was adoption. Adoption was one of the ways a slave would actually become free. Now I want us to talk about masters. And I want to talk about one master. Now we've talked about slaves. A master who's been with us from Genesis. A master who has an understanding of how the world runs. And that's in Genesis 3. And I want us, you to listen to a master who's so cunning. I call him the cunning master, slave master. Now, Genesis 3, 1. Uh, we're told, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. <clears throat> and he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Mm -hmm. How, verse 3. But of the tree, fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Now listen to this master. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. In defiance of God, in defiance of the instruction of the Most High, in defiance of the Creator, this cunning slave master has begun his working with a woman and her husband. Uh, if you look at Genesis 4-7, we see him at play, this time not physically, but influencing. And we are told uh, in, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, and this is, uh, this is Cain being told, if you do well, that's God telling him, will you not be accepted? And if you not do well, Sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. So, ruling over sin is a desire of God, but the desire of this cunning slave master is that sin should rule over you. We can actually see his hand right there. Let's look at Ephesians 2.2. 2. Understand this slave master. Now, this slave master comes with different titles. He's called the serpent. He's called a liar. But look at this one here, uh, Ephesians 2, 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, now he's also called the God of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, he's also called the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So we have sons of disobedience, and sons of disobedience have a slave master. And this slave master is the one who guides them. He's the one who shows them what to do. So we have sons of disobedience. And of course, we have sons of God. And we have those who are adapted as sons. Ephesians 2, 3. Uh, it tells us something. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and, the, and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Just as the others. And we find here that we have some people being classified as children of wrath. Why? They are being associated with a slave master who had authority over them. Matthew 4, 1 to 11, and we are not going to read it. The tempter tempted Jesus. Satan tempts that we may fail. That's a purpose for which Satan tempts us. But God tests us to prove us and make us better. James 1.13. What does he tell us? In, in James 1.13, um, we find a very interesting passage right here. James chapter 1 and verse 13. Now, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God never tempts anyone. Uh, what about verse 14? What does it say in James? But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So we find there is an enemy who can entice someone, but even our own desires can entice us. So we find sometimes, many times, men sin because of their own desires within them, which entice them, or because of the working of the, of, of the cunning slave master, as I love to call him. But God tests us. So God who doesn't tempt you, God tests you. That's like the way you go sit for an exam. It's, it's supposed to prove your knowledge, your understanding. And when you pass that level, you're taken to the next level, and you do that next exam, and after that, you do the next, go to the next level, you do another exam, and test, prove your ability and your capacity, and only take you to the next level. So God tests us to prove us and to prove our faithfulness. But the enemy comes to tempt us and the purpose that we may fall. Now, let's look at John 12, 31. What's another title for this cunning slave master? John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast away. He's also called the ruler of this world. So we have a slave master who is the ruler of this world. And when you're born into this world, you're born with the Adamic sin. And when you're born with the Adamic sin, then you find the ruler of this world who then decides to take church. And as long as you allow him, you purpose to allow him, he then continues to have reign over you. Now, remember the concept of slave. It's different from the working contracts that we have. It's different from the employment agreements that we enter into. This was very, very different. It's about becoming a property of your master. So whoever is property of the master of this world then has to do the bidding of the master. But let's explore now together, now that we've looked at slavery and what it meant to be slaves, and a very cunning master. I want us now to go together to Galatians, to Galatians, and explore together what is Galatians telling us about what we just looked at as a foundation. Galatians 1, 1 and 2 reminds us that an heir, when not of age, was like a domestic slave under the authority of guardians. Under the authority of guardians. That's what was happening. You know, Galatians... Uh, under the authority of the guardians. Uh, so, sorry, that's Galatians uh, 4 1. My apologies. Galatians 4 1. Uh, he was just like a domestic slave because though they were the heirs of the wealth, they could not access it. So there was no difference at all between them and the slave, although he's a master of all, but he cannot access it. I want us to quickly look at two things, the spirit of slavery and the spirit of adoption. Galatians 1, 3 tells, uh, Galatians um, reminds us here, uh, 4, 3, uh, reminds us that we were, sla were in slavery under the basic principle. Um, you know, 4, 3, even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. And that was the spirit of slavery. We were in bondage of this world. So we were born into slavery through the Adamic sin, and we were slaves to the worldly beliefs, we were slaves to the worldly practices, we were slaves of Satan and his evil spirits. And guess what? Because he is a god of this world, and he is a master, so, or so to speak, and we were born into the world, and he is a god of the world, then we were subject to him. Galatians 3.23 tells us we were kept under God. Galatians 4.3.23. Uh, reminds us something here that we were kept under God by the law. That's what the law was doing. But before faith came, we were kept under God by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. So there was an expectation of revelation. What are some of the basic principles that we talk about? We had the rituals, we had traditions, we had customs, uh, Galatians 4.8. We had idol worship, 
We had religious laws. We were enslaved to sin. Why were we enslaved to sin? Because we were slaves. That's why we were enslaved to sin by the God of this world. And that's what he was doing. And that's what he's been doing. And that's what he continues to do. For he tells us, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. I repeat. But when then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. Gods. What about the spirit of adoption? Galatians 4 4. Tells about the fullness of time. The fullness of time. Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 4. Says, In the fullness of time, God sent his son. Or it puts it another way, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in the fullness of time. Verse 5 reminds us something, and this is very special for us, because it's coming from slaves to becoming sons. And we are told in 4-5, he came to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive their adoption as sons. I want to pause there and say that there are many ways one can be blessed with a child. One is when you bear the child uh, to full term, and that's a blessing of a child. And that comes from God and glory to God. But I want to make a mention here that you can also be blessed with a child through adoption. And a lot of people do not understand adoption. And there's been a lot of misconceptions about adoption. But I'm here to tell you, friends, that when God puts that in your heart to adopt, then just need to go to the right authorities and follow the right procedure and pray to God for wisdom and direction. And it's a beautiful blessing to adopt a child, to give them opportunity, to give them chance to grow, to give them opportunities they may not have had as they stayed in their home. And there is nothing wrong with adapting because even we ourselves have been adapted as sons. So what a beautiful thing to adapt. But if you've been having doubts about it, then seek the Lord and pray for the grace. Praise the Lord. And so we are finding there is nothing wrong about adapting. In fact, we ourselves, we are adapted. If you look at verse 5, it says, it reminds us to redeem those uh, yeah, verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5, it tells us we, that we received to redeem those, that is to buy back, praise the Lord, to buy back, to redeem, to buy back those who were under the law. They are bought back. Why are they being bought back? Because the enemy had them. The enemy had taken them. And the only way for them to be free, a price has to be paid. And for the price has to, that has to be paid, someone has to pay that up. And who pays that up? It's a new master. And so a price, God had to pay a price. Because we were in slavery. And we belong to a different master. And the master would not let you go scot-free. Because he wouldn't allow you to go scot-free because he would belong to him. And, so, and you are a slave to him. And so for you to be set free, a price had to be paid. And so to redeem or to buy you back, those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption in sons. So we not only were not only bought back, but we also made sons. Verse 6 reminds us, what does he tell us about that? Let's look at the process of that. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Before that, it was a cunning slave master. But now, once you've been brought into the kingdom of light, hallelujah, and you come to the king of glory, and now you are adapted as a son, you no longer have the bad, evil slave master. You have a heavenly father. And you can call him out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Abba, Father. And when you call him, he not only hears you, he also answers you because you're a son adapted. Verse 7 reminds us a powerful statement. Uh, let's go back to verse 6, actually. Um, 4 verse 6. Uh, there it is, crying out, Abba, Father. So the spirit of his son is in our hearts. 
And that, so we have Jesus Christ, and we have God the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of His Son is in us. And when we cry out, Father, Father hears, why? He knows His Son. And when we call out because we abducted His sons, our Heavenly Father hears. But verse 7 tells us something very sweet. Powerful statement. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. One of the songs I really love is, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. And that's what you get. John 1, 12. It tells us this. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. One more time. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, but as many as received him, even today, as many as we receive him, to them he will give the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. God is still in the business of buying people back. In Galatians 4.9 gives us a very interesting encouragement. Galatians 4.9 what does it say? It reminds us something here, that we have known God, and God has known us. But now, after you have known God, or rather, are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and the beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? And, and we'll be looking at this much later, so to speak, uh, where you've been given freedom. Why would you want to be a slave again? You see, there's some benefits of sonship or benefits of adoption. In Galatians 4, 6, we have fellowship with the Father. We can call him Abba Father. That's one of the ben benefits. We have been redeemed. We've been bought back. That's another benefit. Of course, there are increased opportunities that we didn't have. We are safe, you know, in the arms of a loving and a caring father, and uh, not like the slave master. You know, the, the parent takes responsibility over you. God takes responsibility over you because you're his son. You're his child. And so he takes responsibility over you. But guess what, friends? We receive the spirit of his son. Let's read one more time Romans 8, 15 to 16. Very encouraging. Romans 8, 15 to 16. Let me repeat it again. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I love that. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Hallelujah. We are children of God. And even the Spirit himself bears witness for the same. Let me take you back a little. So how was life under the God of this world? How was life, I'm just recapping it again, just for emphasis. How was life under the God of this world? Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. Let's look at how life was before. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead in trespasses. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now walks in the sons of disobedience. We once were dead, verse 1. We were once dead. Let's look at that one more time. And you, and you he made alive, uh -huh, because we were dead, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we were actually dead in trespasses and sins. In evil, immorality, and we're going to look at what we were dead to. We were dead. What does it mean we were dead in trespasses? Well, we were dead in trespasses. Um, John brings, brings it out very well. And First John 2, 16, 17. Let's see what we were dead to. Dead in. We are dead in something. 1 John 2, 16. And for all that is in the world, the last of the flesh, aha, that was our death, the last of the eyes, another one, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Wait, if it's of the world, it's of the cunning master. His name is Satan. Verse 17. And the world is passing away, and the last of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Last of the flesh. 
in the last of the flesh we find, uh, you know, the world promises to satisfy the legit desires in illegitimate ways. So the last of the flesh, for example, eating is legitimate, but gluttony is worldly, is illegitimate. Sex within marriage is legitimate, but its sexual immorality is illegitimate. And that's the last of the flesh. Then you have the last of the eyes. And here we are finding, this is what you, you see. The world tempts you, desiring, pursuing what is not legitimate. Again, by what we see. But the third one, of course, the pride of life. Pride in one's possessions, living to impress others. No, the world is passing away. You're busy trying to impress everybody else, but the world will pass away. And all that will matter is this. Why are you under the master who is the God of this world? Why are you under the master, the king of glory, the creator of the universe? Did you know all men are created by God, but all men and women are not sons of God? All men and women are created by God, but not all are sons of God. Why? We read before in John 1, 12. You know, as many as received him. So it's only those that received him who are given the right to become children of God. If they have not received him, then they don't get the right. So yes, they are his creation, but they have not received the right to become because they cannot be forced to become. They have to make a choice of becoming. Galatians 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, but as of many, but as of one, and to, to your seed, who is Christ. So it's on account of Christ that we are adapted. Did you know, friends, that even as a people, African people, we cannot claim by lineage connection with Abraham? Because Ham is from where we all descended. For Shem, it's where Abraham and all the others, the Ishmaelites, and all those descended from. However, on account of Christ, we can claim descendancy. Only in Christianity is God called the Father. God is our loving, merciful, caring, and heavenly Father. Well, there's a warning here, friends. A warning against going back. You see, you may be a son, but don't become a renegade son. In Colossians 2.20, there's a warning right here. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? 20, verse 23 reminds us, Colossians 2.23, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. False humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So it's not about the law. It's about grace. Um, do not love the world or anything in the world. 1 John 2, 15, 17. And there's a very nice warning here. Do not love the world or the things of the world. Now remember the God of this world. If anyone loves the world, uh -huh, and you know who the God of this world is, the love of the Father is not in him. 16. For all that is in the world, the last of the flesh, we are repeating, the last of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 17. And the world is passing away and the last of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, we need to put to death the deeds of the flesh. We need to put to death the ways of the evil master. But there has to be a shift. We have to accept to be redeemed by the Son of God. To be redeemed because he paid a price at the cross at Calvary. To be redeemed by him, we have to accept that redemption. And we have to accept to join the new master. We don't have to go back. So what is the evidence of sonship? If you went out there on the streets or in the marketplace or in the place of work, or wherever you go, how can you tell this one has been adapted as a son and this one has not been adapted as a son, as a son or has refused to be adapted as a son because there's also a choice? There's a way. There's a way that you can tell. And one of them is 
as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Um, you know, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the son of God, sons of God. So if somebody is Spirit-led, then that one is a very good evidence that they are, have been adapted as sons. But there's a second one. Galatians 5.16. He says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. It supports the first one. Though if you find someone who walks in the spirit and in their very walk, they're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, that's another evidence, so to speak. So number one, if they are spirit-led, Number two, if they are walking in the spirit, and what is the evidence of that? They are not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. But there's a third one here. And this is found in Matthew 7, 15 to 20. And this one, I'd like us to read it together. Because it's Jesus who's explaining this. And he puts it so well as part of the evidence of those who have moved from slaves to sons. And Matthew 7, 5, 7, 15 tells us, Be aware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Now, so evidence of sonship, number one, is they are spirit-led. As many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. But secondly, we've noticed they walk in the spirit and they don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. The third thing we are finding, you will know them by their fruits. But there's a fourth thing I want you to note here. And this is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And what is this? But the fruit of the Spirit, aha, and the Spirit is in you. The Spirit of Sonship is in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And guess what? What is the fruit of the Spirit that's dwelling in you? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, as such, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit. And so there are four things which give you the evidence that someone has shifted from being a slave to becoming a son. And they're number one, they're led by their spirit and they don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Number two, uh, num num number one is they're they spirit-led and as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. That's evidence. They're the sons of God. And what's the evidence of this? We find they walk in their spirit, don't fulfill the desires of the flesh, and by their fruits you will know them. So they are fruits, and their fruits will tell you who they really are. But guess what, friends? We haven't told what these fruits are. They are joy. Do you see joy in that person? Do you see peace? Are they peace-loving people? Are they long-suffering? Are they kind are they good? Do you see goodness in them? Do you see faithfulness? Are they reliable? Are they dependable? So to speak, because they are and they're faithful to their king and to their Lord. Are they gentle? A spirit of gentleness? And do they demonstrate self-control? Let me tell you, friends, when we're moving from slaves to sons, there's such a huge shift that anyone who meets us will know. These ones have been with the master. I want us to pray. Let's close our eyes wherever you are. Heavenly Father, I pray. If there is anyone who has not received you, may they make the decision today to move from being slaves with the cunning slave master and to become sons of the Most High God. Jesus has paid it all on the cross. And he's saying, if you're willing, it's whoever receives, becomes, and gets a right to become. So if you're there, you may say this prayer after me if you want to make that decision. Dear Jesus, I come before you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I no longer want to be under the, the cunning slave master. From today, I want to be under your Lordship. I want you to be my King and my Lord and my Savior. Make me a new creation. And I want to have the evidence of sonship. 
the fruits of the Spirit being evident. Each of them being seen, I'll walk in the Spirit and not feel the desires of the flesh. Because I'm led of the Spirit, there's evidence I'm the Son of God. And from today, henceforth, I make that decision. To the glory of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord equip you. May the Lord strengthen you as you walk as sons and you walk out of the spirit of slavery and the spirit of bondage. May the Lord bless you. Thank you. We thank God for that powerful word that has come to us today uh, on sonship. Pray it's been a blessing to you. And we want to come to another uh, stage of a service where we get to give. And we invite you to use the numbers that will be on the screen uh, to give even as we give unto the Lord and give to the Lord cheerfully. Uh, I want us to give thanks because of our giving. Lord, we thank you for even what we are about to give, Lord. It is you who has given unto us. Lord, we give with thanksgiving, and may you be glorified. We pray that these resources, Lord, will be used, Lord, for to further your agenda, God. They'll be used, Father, Lord, to enlarge your kingdom, O oh God, and you be glorified. We thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. And as we use the numbers on our screen, we'll take a short time just to confess this uh, confession that God will make a way. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that he will cause streams to sprout from desert. So it doesn't matter how it looks like, God can still make a way. Amen. It's one from the books, right? And I pray it will be a blessing to us. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way. He will make a way. Singing. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side. With love, with love and strength. For each new day, He will make a way. He will make a way. By the roadside in the wilderness, He led me. Rivers in the desert will I see. Heaven and earth will fade, but His word will still remain. He will do something new today. Oh, God will make a way. He will make a way. Where there seems to be no way. He works in ways. He works in ways we cannot see. For each new day, He will make a way. He One more time. Oh, a God will make a way. Oh, God will make a way. Where there seems to be no way. He works in ways. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way. a way for you he'll make a way for us and no matter how it looks like 
He's a promise keeper and he's a way maker. Amen. 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 We come to the end of our service and we pray that this service has been a blessing to you. And may the Lord God bless you. May you have a wonderful week ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord make a way.